So I'm going to try to freestyle this. All right, so quick disclaimer. All the video that you see in this presentation, I shot on my phone. Um, all the video that you don't see, in lieu of me getting permission to use it, I want you to just use your imagination. How high is the water, mama? Old beat high and ride. How high is the water, papa? All right, I'd like to talk to you about Johnny Cash. If you're not familiar with Johnny Cash and his work, he was born in 1932, and he grew up in Dias, Arkansas, picking cotton on his family's farm. And then he started his music career in 1954 and gained nationwide popularity with a string of early hits. And then he went on to record across five decades and in multiple genres. He was inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the Gospel Hall of Fame before, sadly, he passed away in 2003. And this year marks the 50th anniversary of the recording of At Folsom Prison, which is an album he made in Folsom Prison. And his label, Columbia, at the time was reluctant to, to release such an album. But they released it, and it was a huge success for Johnny Cash. And is a good example of Johnny Cash challenging the conventional boundaries of, of the music industry. Were you there? Now, another example of challenging convention. Johnny Cash initially Lord. wanted to record gospel music. And uh, he established a pattern when he felt Were reluctance from record companies. He would have a hit song or a hit album, and then his next project would be purely a gospel project. And it wasn't until he started recording uh, with Rick Rubin as, a, as his producer that he enjoyed uh, some freedom, and he was able to record gospel without a producer worrying about balancing the sensibilities of a non-gospel and a gospel audience. There's a man going around taking names. So this song, the man comes around. This is an especially vivid example of conviction and, and vision for a modern gospel. It represents an expanded rock sensibility. It's also a bridge to Johnny Cash's past. So we're going to work toward creating a visualization that measures the audible distance between the man comes around and music at either ends of Johnny Cash's career. So what we need to do is identify Johnny Cash gospel music in this enormous catalog is recorded music. And you might think, OK, well, this is really easy. We'll just take all the tracks from his gospel albums. But if we do that, then we're going to miss important gospel songs that only appear on his mainstream albums. So we're going to look at his lyrics, and we're going to use a technique called topic modeling. Now, topic modeling is an algorithmic approach to finding latent structures um, occurring in a collection of documents. So documents, in our case, are songs, and the topics are a list of words occurring in statistically meaningful ways in those, in those, uh, across the, the collection of songs. So this approach assumes that words referring to similar subjects appear in the same context. And you can imagine an author constructing a body of text by pulling from buckets of words. And these buckets of words uh, may be uh, one bucket might be uh, referring to human senses and another to trains. But when the author has laid out the, the core meaning of what they're trying to convey, then they can add some structure and you have a document. So topic modeling attempts to reverse engineer this process. We want to go from the songs to the buckets to those list of words that represent dominant themes in Johnny Cash music. So I created a topic modeling using some software, and it uses 10 buckets. And the bucket that we want to use and, and, uh, and focus on is the one that has words like God and Lord and Jesus. And it's going to be the topic that we're going to use to identify religious-oriented music in his catalog. So what we're going to do first is represent every Johnny Cash recording as a single white pixel along this horizontal line. And we're going to, we're going to uh, lay it out in sequential order by initial recording date and track position. And when we map these songs, well, first of all, if we do this, we're going to have his earliest recordings, the recordings he made with Sam Phillips, his first producer at Sung Records. And then at the right-hand side, we're going to have the last recording he ever made, and this was with Rick Rubin. And we're going to map all the songs that we've labeled as religious-oriented songs 
And you're going to see an interesting distribution. There's a cluster at the left, you know, at the very beginning, a cluster in the middle, and a cluster at the right. So we're, we're interested in, in comparing early to late. So we're going to filter out everything in the middle, and we're going to get 16 explicitly gospel songs. And this leaves us with 16 songs. It's nine in the early gospel period. This is Sun Records, Columbia. And then seven that are in the late gospel period, and these are all exclusively with the Americans Recordings Projects uh, and Rick Rubin. All right, you, rec you may recognize this as a waveform. So now we've got our gospel songs. We need a, w a way to compare them, and we need to do that audibly, right? So this waveform, we, we usually associate these with digital recordings, and the oscillations in amplitude represent a change in input signal over time. And looking at this, we can infer certain things about the sound. We can infer length or uh, possibly tempo. But if we want to get more detail, we need to use something called spectrum analysis. So spectrum analysis, it uh, renders volume levels of specific frequency ranges. So this represents a tenth of a second on an open A string on a violin. And those peaks that you see at the sixth octave register, those represent the most dominant features in this sound. So if we, if we combine spectral analysis with machine learning, then we can derive higher level audio attributes, right? So danceability and acousticness and loudness. And then if we combine those, we can get an even higher representation of the overall audio attributes called an acoustic vector. All right, so now we can represent a song as a vector. But what is a vector? So really quick, a vector represents a physical quantity that has both a uh, magnitude and a direction. That's a lot of math really quick. But what's really nice is we can use vector math to add and subtract vectors, and we can even then get the average of two or more vectors, and we're going to call that the mean vector. And we'll use the mean vector when we're comparing periods uh, early and late. So we're going to build a really quick example, a toy example. We have a list of songs. And let's say that we measure the level of treble and the level of bass in these songs. We map those levels between negative 1 and 1. I can represent all of these songs as an array of two-dimensional vectors. But then I can plot them, right? So now we can get a sense of how they relate to each other. And I can take, then, the average vector and do some interesting comparisons. So this song that is closest to the average, it sounds the most similar. It sounds most like the average, while this song is the furthest away, and it sounds the most distinctive. All right, so when talking about The Man Comes Around with Robert Hilburn in an interview, he said, Johnny Cash said, if someone is still listening to my music 50 years from now, if someone is listening at all, I hope they're listening to that song. So here he is. He's written hundreds of songs. We're at the end of his career, and he's telling us he's written his most important song. So it's interesting because in the same interview, he tells us explicitly that this is a gospel song, but it doesn't sound like the same gospel songs that were written in that later period. But this was intentional. And if you hear, you can hear that kind of strumming on the guitar. That was something that was like a signature sound from his early style. And Marty Stewart, the guitar player on this track, actually played Luther Perkins's Fender Esquire guitar that was used in those early recordings. So they went way out of their way to sound authentic, but at a much later period. So to, to visualize the difference between The Man Comes Around and the late gospel recordings, so let's say this dot represents the acoustic mean of all the, the late gospel songs plus The Man Comes Around. And the radius represents the audible distance from the acoustic uh, average. The most similar sounding song in this collection is Redemption from the side of off of American Recordings. The and then you can guess that this one out here is The Man Comes Around. So this is the most distinctive of the group. And then we can compare the relative magnitude of The Man Comes Around to the acoustic mean of both the early and late gospel. And you can see it's, it's pretty uh, distant from both. And then if you flip this over, and knowing what we know about the intent of the song, it was explicitly meant to, re to, to reference this earlier sound, we can kind of think it, of it metaphorically as this fulcrum uh, between the early and the late uh, gospel periods. So the American recordings period, it marks the first time where Johnny Cash felt free and uninhibited to record gospel. 
And it kind of invites us to compare all the early gospel to all the late gospel instead of just between the man comes around. So we're going to fuse these two periods together, and we're going to put the late gospel on the right. And again, the distance from the, the, uh, the half screen there uh, represents the distance, the acoustic mean of that period. And then we can compare to the early gospel. And you can see that the late gospel, the songs are more distinctive, and they cover a broader sonic range. OK, well, the question here now is why? Well, there's a darker side to Johnny Cash's gospel. It's not all good news. And Sam Phillips' audience wasn't ready for good news gospel, uh-oh, <laughs> um, or bad news gospel. Um, but uh, Rick Rubin's audience was, was, was fully uh, ready to accept uh, more realistic uh, lyrical themes and fully accepted Johnny Cash and his music. So the difference in attitude between these two producers represents modern rock and roll's expanded sensibility. Early rock was narrowly defined and intentionally segregated from other genres. But by now, modern rock audiences have developed a sophisticated ear and broadened the genre's boundaries to include more diverse references. So one of these is gospel. And when you mix modern rock with you know, gospel and especially kind of the darker interpretation, the darker side, you get a mix that's appealing to a modern rock audience. So listen to the audience right here. Whoops. Sorry, guys. Bad timing. Can we turn the... Uh... So I don't know, you know, how often everyone in this, in this venue at this concert goes to church, but they all know every word of this song, and you'll hear it. And I bet most of you know the words as well. So thanks. <laughs> 